Hello and welcome to the study in the US um, webinar that we're running this evening um, from here um, at the Fulbright Commission. Um, could I just check it? Can it's, anyone hear me? If you can hear me, um, I'd really appreciate it if you could just drop a message um, into the webinar chat window, just so that I know um, that uh, you can hear me okay. Brilliant. Thank you so much to everybody who is responding. Um, perfect. So uh, my name is Rowena. Um, I'm the director of advising here at Fulbright. Um, so my job is to help um, people from around the UK um, figure out how to study in the US and how they can go go about that process. Um, and that's what we that's what we do here at Fulbright. Um, tonight we're going to go through uh, an introduction to studying in the USA. We're going to hit some of the um, areas that we get the most number of questions about. Um, we will be sending out um, the recording of this uh, presentation, this webinar, um, out later in the week. So if you've registered for this, we'll also send it out so that you can refer back to it later on. Um, and there is a Q&A function um, in your uh, webinar panel. So um, if you have any questions um, as we go along, um, I'll be taking questions towards the end. So if you have any questions, please do pop them in the Q&A um, room and I'll go through those at the end. Um, so as you can probably tell, I'm from the UK. I, I grew up here, I did GCSEs and I did A-levels. Um, and then I had this incredible opportunity to go and study in the US. Um, and I had never been there before. Um, it wasn't somewhere my family had been able to go. Um, and I jumped on a plane and headed over to California where I had the most amazing experience studying at a US university that um, none of my friends and family had heard, heard of before. Um, and I had this incredible experience and it's really uh, shaped who I was and what I became. Um, and obviously right now I'm doing this job, but it, it really shaped who I was. So I'm really passionate about um, studying in the US. Um, so to go through, we're going to go through some of these, um, these top questions, top areas, things that want, people want to ask us about. Um, and like I say, if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A as we go along. So you might be wondering, um, who are we? Um, so I work at Fulbright. Fulbright is based here in the UK, in London. Um, it's a, a non-profit organization um, set up by um, the guy on the screen right here, um, Senator Fulbright, who was an American senator who, after the Second World War, had this grand idea um, to help um, prevent another world war, to help countries understand each other better. Um, he set up this idea of a Fulbright scholarship, which was paid by the American government to allow people from other countries to come and study in the US, um, and then people from the US to go and study in those other countries. Um, and so the Fulbright scholarships, 70 years on, we're still here. Um, we've just had our 70th anniversary, and these scholarships are for postgraduate level. Um, but, but we very much live in that ethos of um, cultural understanding. Um, so one of the other things that we do at, here at Fulbright is run um, what's called the Education USA Services, which is what this is part of. Um, and this is very much um, how we help people understand how to apply to US universities. Um, our advice is always given for free, um, and we help um, give unbiased advice um, to students through a variety of different ways um, and, and to help you study in the US. Um, so if your dream is to study in the USA, um, we're here to help and we'll try and take you through um, some of these, these things that you need to know. And we're coming at it very much as um, people applying from the UK. So we'll be talking about GCSEs and A-levels and hires if you're in Scotland um, so that you know how, how this process works. Um, so one of the questions that we get a lot is um, why should someone actually go and study in the US when we've got some great universities here in the UK? Um, why do people go and choose to study in the US? And so here are just a few of the reasons. So um, often what we hear a lot about is, is the reputation and variety of US universities. So you might know that here in the UK, um, at the undergraduate level, we have about 120 universities. Um, in the US, there's four and a half thousand universities. Um, so it's a, 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 lot, a much bigger pool of universities um, and they're really different to each other. Each university is really different um, and it means that there's a good fit university for everybody. Um, 
we can also have a look at things like campus life. So in the US, um, you know, US universities spend a lot of time um, developing their both their campus as a whole, but also the activities and services available to students. So um, US universities really invest in this and it's a very vibrant part of campus life, whether it's supporting an American football team or whether it's the um, clubs and societies that people can get involved in. All of these things are a reason why people choose the US. Um, and then you've got the academic flexibility. So one of the things that's really attractive to a student in the UK um, is that you don't have to know what you want to study when you go to apply to a US university. Unlike here in the UK, you don't pick a course um, to, to apply to. Um, instead, you have this opportunity and you're encouraged and expected to study a broad range of subjects, particularly in your first, maybe in your second year, before choosing your specialisation. So it means you can go in undeclared. Um, you don't have to know what you want to study um, to go to the US. Um, and it does mean that you can explore different um, academic fields before you commit to one, one field um, for your specialisation. Another reason students often choose the US is because there are some really generous funding opportunities out there. Um, lots of people know that US higher education looks very expensive, um, and, but there are ways you can um, unlock funding to help make a dream a reality, um, particularly if you're willing to be a bit open-minded um, about the opportunities out there. Um, and then you can also think about US study and how it relates to employment. So um, often moving to a different country to study, um, having that experience of working with other people who have maybe have very different life experiences to you, sets you really up really well for um, the future job market, for your employability um, and in the future. And then of course, a lot of people want to experience US culture. In my case, I've never been to the US, but it, it was really useful for me to understand a country um, with an awful lot of different perspectives to bust all the myths that I had thought um, were out there um, and a country that has, um, you know, a lot of uh, um, influence within popular culture. Um, so, you know, just a really great way to explore the world. So what are those key differences with UK study? So the first one would be around um, the duration of study. Um, so if you are looking to compare a UK bachelor's degree, a BSc or a BA, um, what you'll see is that that's three years long, whereas in the US, a bachelor's degree is four years long. Um, so that don't be confused by that. Um, that's the standard in the US. Um, but there are a few universities that will offer um, an associate's degree, which is a two year degree um, and is equivalent to a diploma here in the UK. Um, or you can look at doing two years to get an associate's degree and then a final two years in order to get um, uh, in order to get this kind of two plus two model. And we're going to talk a bit more about why someone might do that later on in this presentation. Um, other differences you're going to find is that um, when you're applying to a US university, you're not applying to um, a particular department. So where in the UK you might apply to do chemistry at Bristol, um, and you're applying into the chemistry department, it's chemistry professors who read your application. Um, in the US, it's going to be an admissions officer who's looking at a whole pool of people, um, and their objective will be to build the most diverse class possible. Um, and that means that they don't want to just admit all the chemists or all the engineers, um, they want to build a really well-rounded class. So it's worth thinking about that as you're applying. They also want to know more about you perhaps than just your interest in chemistry or just your interest in physics or just your interest in English. They're going to want to know more about you as a person. In the US, you'll find that um, universities have a lot of freedom. Um, it's a very American concept. Um, but it, what it means is that universities can be very different to each other, and that's an amazing thing and often very attractive. But what it also means is that unlike the UK, there are no um, set deadlines, there's no one application system, um, and there are no set fees. So universities can do um, very much um, as they want uh, in the US. And so it means that you're going to have to shift if you're looking to apply to a US university, shift some of those expectations you might have about there's only one way to do something. Um, and then finally, I just want to make sure that everybody um, knows that there are some exceptions, subjects that you can't really study at undergraduate level in the US, unlike 
when you're studying here in the UK. Um, so these two exceptions, um, particularly, would be law and medicine. Um, neither of these subjects are available at undergrad. Um, it's just not something that American students um, study. So um, I can pick up in the Q&A if anyone has um, more questions about that. Um, so just let me know in the Q&A if you want me to talk more about that. So what does a timeline applying to a US university look like? Um, we're going to take you through um, a, a kind of general timeline. Each university might be different, um, but this is what you'll be looking at. So the first part of the process is about researching your universities. Unlike um, here in the UK, um, you can't just log into UCAS um, and see all the universities and all the courses. Um, instead, you're going to be wanting to spend your time really um, getting under the skin of the different universities you're looking at, exploring a whole bunch of universities you've probably never heard of. Um, but you're going to want to do that. And if you're in year 12 right now, um, this is the key time to be able to do it. If you're in year 11 or earlier, then this is a really great thing to be getting started with. Um, but you want to be doing this in the kind of year before you're, you're planning to apply. And then something else that happens, and we're going to talk about these more in a moment, um, there are some admissions exams that some students may find that they need to take. Um, getting these taken um, in year 12 is a really great way to use the time. Um, so you're going to want to register for those exams, sit those exams, um, and we'll talk more about those um, shortly. And then if we approach the summer of year 12 um, or the year before you plan to enroll, um, you're going to want to start to slim your list, your research list down into six to 10 schools or thereabouts um, to apply to. And then if you're in year 13 um, in, in England, Wales or Northern Ireland, then you're going to be looking um, at putting together your application. Um, and that's going to be happening in the autumn of year 13. Um, so about the same time um, as perhaps things like medicine or Oxbridge applications are happening, um, it's about the same time that you'll be putting together your applications and submitting them to your US universities. Um, different universities have different deadlines, so you need to keep an eye on that and it needs to be part of the research process. Um, so after you've submitted your applications, um, you'll find that universities released admissions decisions at different times. Um, most universities, um, if you apply for a deadline um, around the 1st of January, you'll find universities tend to release those um, towards the end of March. Um, if you apply for an admissions deadline somewhere around the end, uh, beginning of November, you'll find they'll release them in December. Some universities won't have deadlines at all and will just release when they're ready. Um, but you'll receive your admissions decision. Most students find that that happens in the springtime, um, kind of March, April time. Um, and you'll make a decision about which university you're going to enroll at, um, normally around May time, um, depending on the university. Um, and then once you've done that, um, we're now talking about three months out from starting your studies, you'll apply for a visa, a student visa, to be able to go and study in the US. Um, and then you can have a look at all the pre-departure information on our website. Um, we also run webinars about pre-departure for, for students heading off to the US. Um, and then you'll begin your studies. And most universities in the US will start their um, autumn terms either in August or perhaps early September. Um, so they normally start earlier than we do here in the UK. Um, so that's the kind of timeline that you'll be looking at. Obviously, if you're in year 13 right now and looking to take a gap year, you would move this process um, further forward. Um, but that, that's the, the in general kind of timeline that we're looking at. So how does somebody go about choosing a US university, especially if we know um, that there's four and a half thousand of them? Uh, where do you start? And this is what this section um, is going to be about. Um, so the first thing and probably the most important thing, particularly if you're looking at a competitive university, is this idea of fit. It's really important that you um, figure out what is going to be a good fit for you. So you're going to want to have a think about um, perhaps some factors first. So you want to think about, do you want to be on a large university where there's huge amounts going on, but you're going to be in big lecture theatres um, with hundreds of other students? Do you want to be on a small university um, where you're going to get to know your professors really well um, and there's lots of research opportunities? Do you want to be in the middle of a big city 
um, is that your fit? Um, but are you willing to take on the extra cost of living that comes with doing something like that? Um, there's all sorts of factors. Do you want to be at a university that prioritizes sports? Or do you want to be at a university where um, people are very academic and very focused on their studies? Um, all of these things and many more are things that you want to think about as you start to try and take four and a half thousand universities into a much more manageable list. And when we see students being successful in this process, it's because they have spent time thinking about what is a good fit for them. And then they've gone and found those universities. Um, and what you'll find is that not every university is a good fit for you. Um, so, so someone's fit will be um, great for that person, but it might not be a fit for you. Um, so just being really aware of that. And if you're especially looking at um, extremely competitive universities, this idea of fit is going to be really important. So we've got several different types of US universities going on. So firstly, we'll just talk about public universities. So these are paid for by the, the taxpayers in the US. They tend to be very large universities, sometimes 40, 50,000 students. Um, they have often large lecture theatres. Don't be surprised if you're sat in, in a room with 300 other people. Um, and they will use graduate students um, to, to teach, but there'll be a lot happening. It'll be a buzzy kind of big campus. Um, and um, that, that'll be one of the factors there. But it's worth noting that public universities tend to have less money to give away in scholarships to students. Then you've got private universities. Um, private universities are um, often funded through endowments. Um, they tend to be a lot smaller than the public universities, um, but they tend to have very um, uh, lots of resources available, both to invest in the student experience on campus, but also to um, cover uh, things like financial aid and things like that, money for students to study there. But what they will have is very scary price tags. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And then you can see things like women's colleges, which we don't have so much here in the UK. Um, but just being aware that there are women's colleges um, in the US um, and provide they often um, provide an incredible environment for young women. Um, they are very popular with recruiters for um, top top recruiting firms uh, often go go there. They tend to be very academically rigorous um, and provide opportunities for amazing alumni networks. So for example, Hillary Clinton went to a school called Wellesley, which is a women's college in Boston. Um, and so just being aware that those are out there as well. They often have join ups with um, other local colleges so other other universities or colleges in the area um, so it's not that you're never going to meet um, a guy uh, along the way um, and then you've got something called a liberal arts college um, liberal arts colleges are a feature we don't really have here in the uk um, liberal arts colleges tend to only have undergraduate students um, and they uh, offer a full range of majors and they have research producing professors but because they don't really have graduate students, they specialize in teaching excellence, and there are all sorts of opportunities for um, uh, people to pick up uh, research opportunities. So they tend to be a lot smaller, um, and some of the students that we've worked with in the past, um, it's not uncommon for them to have had a research paper, you know, they've worked on a research paper with their professor, and they're published even before they've actually graduated from their bachelor's degree. So just being aware that there's these different universities out there, um, and there's also these specialist institutions, these can be particularly focused on things like art, um, and agriculture, and things like that. So um, just be, be aware that there's lots of different types of university along the way too. Okay, so once you're starting to think about that research process and starting to take a look at the landscape, um, you start to narrow down your options. And we're gonna talk you through here um, a tool that we use a lot in the office and we find really helpful. Um, but you're going to want to take all those different types of universities you've been looking at and really start to get under the skin of kind of six to 10 different universities. Um, and this is a way that you might be able to do it. Um, so what you're looking at here on screen um, is something called Big Future College Search. And um, that's Big Future College Search. Um, if you just Google that, it will come up as your first result and you can head into it and use this. And um, it's like a search engine just for US universities. 
Um, and so what you have in it is around 4,000 um, of the universities, all with profiles um, and a way to search through them um, to find different universities that might be a good fit for you. Um, you can see on the uh, left hand side of my screen here, um, you can see the filters and these are often around some of these um, factors that will determine your fit um, and we'll sh I'll show you how we, we can use those to start to slimline this list of 4,000 universities into something that might be um, a much more manageable list to research. So imagining that I have gone into Big Future College Search, um, I've decided in this example that I'm looking for a university offering four-year degrees, um, and I've decided I would like a medium-sized university. Um, and I've also never been to Ohio, so I'm interested to see what is going on there. So I've decided that in the location field, I'm going to make sure that I'm looking at Ohio. Um, and then the other factor I just want to flag, um, in my particular case, um, I know that I'm going to need some support with um, covering the cost of attending a US university. So in the paying section, um, I've gone in there and I've made sure that I've checked a box saying in financial aid available for international students. Um, and so this is now filtered down the universities in Ohio that offer a four year degree that are medium sized and offer financial aid to international students into this group of universities here that you can see. Um, and so this is the kind of tool that you can use as long as you know what you're looking for, you can start to use these tools to, to um, produce a list of US universities to spend some more time researching. Um, so in this example, I'm going to jump into the um, university there called Denison. Um, I can see that. So I'm going to go and have a little look. Um, and what you'll find is as you click into these profiles, um, you'll find each university has a profile, it has a little bit of an overview, um, it has some related universities, but it also has a link off to the university's website. And you can jump in straight in there um, and start to find out a bit more. Um, and in this particular case, I can see that this is a private liberal arts college, um, it's co ed, um, suburban setting offering bachelor's degrees, and I might go in and find out a bit more about Denison. Um, and the thing we know about Denison is that they have generous financial aid available for international students. So it's the kind of, once you click into their website, you can start to read a bit more about that. So that's the kind of research process that you want to be going through for the different universities um, that you're looking at. So how can you go through um, finding out a little bit more um, about universities? Um, definitely spend time looking at their um, uh, websites. They have whole sections. Often many of them will have a page just for international students, um, which is what you and I would be. Um, and so you can read more about uh, information specifically for you. You can check out their social media um, feeds. So whether that's Facebook or YouTube, watch some campus tours, meet some students who study there. But you can also, um, most US universities will have Snapchat, they'll have Instagram. So you can go on and follow them in whatever social media um, fields you'd like. You can also start to write to them. They'll have their admissions officers, contact, email address um, on the website. So you can start to ask questions um, even before you've applied. Um, and you can also often find if they're coming to the UK and maybe doing a presentation in the UK um, before you even go. Um, in terms of the number of schools, um, technically you can apply to as many US universities as you like. It's not here like here in the UK where you're limited to five choices. Um, so in theory you can apply to as many as you like but we would suggest somewhere between six and ten um, well thought out good fit universities for you would be the kind of number that you want to aim for. Um, any more than that and I think you would start to find it's an awful lot of work um, but there's also often an application fee that goes alongside it so it can start to get very expensive um, to apply to a lot of universities and you're probably not going to be putting the best um, uh, best application forward. Um, our suggestion would be that you look for perhaps two universities that are a stretch for you, where you're going to be, um, you know, it's a bit of a reach for you. Uh, you're going to want to have a couple of universities where you are a really good fit, you know that your application 
um, is a really um, solid application, you know that you will do well in the admissions pool. And that you also want to have a couple of schools um, which are more sure schools, schools where you know you'll be at the top of the admissions pool um, and that you've got that kind of mix. Um, sometimes we see students applying to just competitive, ultra competitive universities and then wondering why they don't get any offers. Um, so the case is just to spread your options out a little bit along the way. Okay, so just to give you some examples of some schools that perhaps you haven't heard of so far, um, but totally should check out. So, for example, you might never have heard of Reed College. So, Reed College is on the West Coast. Um, it's a private liberal arts college. Um, it, students have a really strong honour code. Um, so, and they're, you know, high, highly academic uh, university. Um, students studying multiple different uh, majors at the same time. Um, it's also a little bit famous because Steve Jobs of Apple uh, went in at Reed um, but didn't actually finish his degree he went off to set up his um, computer computer company along the way so you might not have heard of Reed but that's an example of a liberal arts college and then if you're thinking about a public university uh, University of Texas at Austin um, is another example so this is a big state university and you can see here in the picture you've got the football stadium a multitude of um, buildings, you'll have lots more students kind of living on and off campus, um, very much uh, part of the scene in Austin, so huge campus presence um, there. But then you might also be interested in exploring perhaps bits of the US that you maybe haven't heard of or, or been too much. Um, Colorado gets more than 300 days of um, sunshine a year um, and uh, is, a, is a really great state if you're into the outdoors. Um, they, you go skiing in the winter and then mountains and hiking in, in the summer. Um, so somewhere like Colorado College um, is another private liberal arts college, but they do some really interesting things um, with their um, academics. So at Colorado College, rather than studying several classes at once, what you do is study one class intensively for a couple of weeks, and then you finish it and you move on to your next class. So you don't have several classes running at the same time, um, and they call it their block plan. Um, it's really interesting and totally something to check out. Um, we get a lot of questions about the Ivy League, um, and so I just want to make sure that um, we've covered that. Um, the Ivy League is not the equivalent of the Russell Group, it's the first thing to say. Um, the Ivy League um, is a, a group of eight universities um, in the US um, that got together and decided to play football against each other. So they were all within a drive of each other. Um, they're some of the oldest universities on the Northeast Coast. Um, and that is all they are as a football league. Um, so, for example, Stanford in California, never going to be in the Ivy League. MIT, not in the Ivy League, never going to be in the Ivy League. So just being aware that um, if you uh, decide that you're only going to look at Ivy League universities, you're going to be looking at eight universities um, and missing all these other incredible universities out there. Um, in, in the UK, if we talk about one, top 1% 1 of universities, we're talking about one to two universities. Um, if we're talking about 1% in the US, that's 40 to 50 universities, um, most of which most people in the UK can't name. Um, so just being very open-minded about um, what does good mean. Um, those 40 universities are incredibly selective to get into um, and receive thousands upon thousands um, of applications to attend. Um, so I'll just give you some stats um, for Harvard last year. Um, Harvard received uh, for the, this year's class uh, in the region of 45,000 applications. Um, they have 1,600 seats. Um, so incredibly competitive and these were applications from students with top grades um, all across, across the board, top test scores. Um, so just being aware that some universities are incredibly competitive. It's not that you shouldn't necessarily apply to them if you're a good fit for them, but just being aware that you don't want to limit your options too much. 
Okay, so funding. So this is an area that we get a lot of questions about, because, partly because it works so differently to here in the UK. Um, so um, the first thing to talk about when it comes to funding is there is money available, um, but it does require some looking for. It's not necessarily an easy to find process, um, but people who are willing to put in the time um, can find some quite interesting um, things. Um, so couple of things that I just want to mention. Um, in the US, you're going to find that always US universities will put their cost of attendance on their website. Um, so the cost of attendance is the cost of the tuition fee, but also the additional cost of perhaps living on campus, cost of books, cost of a meal plan, um, all those additional costs. And they will round that all up into one figure and call that the cost of attendance. And that is per year. So if you're comparing to UK universities, you want to make sure that you're accounting for a room in halls um, and perhaps a meal plan, a bus ticket, books, all of those other costs that come with studying here in the UK as well. Um, and you'll find that all US universities will put this amount on their website. Um, so you want to make sure that you can um, find that and find that in their admissions section. Um, and lots of universities will offer financial aid, um, which is the term that they use to international students. Um, so it is a case of finding ways to, to offset what essentially is a sticker price um, with additional scholarships or financial aid to make up um, some of that, that um, gap that you might have there. So what are the sources of funding? So um, this is in order of, ranked in order of importance. These are the funds that you would be looking at to study in the US with. So the first thing that, um, just to highlight, is US universities will always expect a family um, or a student to be looking uh, at the resources they have available to themselves and to be willing to contribute those to come and study at their uni university. So if you have um, funds set aside that they will expect that a, 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 a student will be um, using those primarily for their studies. However, um, the next best source of funding for UK students looking to study in the US is actually the US universities themselves. So um, some universities will offer scholarships um, to study um, at their university. Um, and this is because they're perhaps looking for um, the, the the, the best applicants and some universities will have, offer something called financial aid um, and we're going to talk about a little bit more about that in a second um, but it's worth looking out for on their websites and then you might find that some you know, um, some uh, you might be able to find uh, information about some what we call external funding bodies. These are you know, um, bodies that aren't the university um, but offer some kind of scholarship. So examples might be foundations, might be um, companies, um, some, some companies put money out for scholarships and you may find that you qualify for some of these. Although the thing I'd just add about these is they tend to be smaller. Um, in their amounts and don't tend to cover the full cost. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit more about those in a second. Um, and then finally, there are loans. Um, so unfortunately, you can't take a UK student loan with you to study in the US. It doesn't go with you. Um, and as an international student, you don't qualify for US student loans. Um, it's not something that's open to us. So if you are looking for money, um, our recommendation would really be to start with personal family funds and then looking at US universities. Um, we wouldn't normally advise taking out some kind of commercial loan um, unless you you really are sure what, what you're doing there uh, to make sure that the cost of study is affordable. So just thinking about that university funding which is the place that most British students find um, that they are most accessible in terms of um, in terms of getting money. Um, so there is something called need-based aid. So need-based aid, the best way to think about this is money you would need in order to be able to attend. Um, and the way this works is university will, if they offer this kind of need-based financial aid, um, they will look at the resources available to a family. 
Um, so what do the what do the parents earn? What does the student does the student have a part time job? What do they earn? Um, how much uh, how many savings um, has the family made towards higher education? And they will take all of that. And then if they want to admit the student, they will look at the total cost of attendance. And if there is a gap between what the family has um, and the cost of attendance, then they will help make up that gap. Um, so that is need-based aid, um, it's money you would need to be able to attend um, and it can be very generous um, but it was also generally very competitive so you want to make sure that you're a really good fit for the universities that you're looking to apply to. And then you have merit-based scholarships. So this is not um, based on your financial need, um, but this is instead based uh, on because you're the best at something. So you might qualify for a merit-based scholarship because you are perhaps on the top test takers in the application pool. It might be because you have the best grades of somebody applying to that university from the UK. Maybe it's because you are the best football player or the best tennis player um, or perhaps you are the best trumpet player. There are often scholarships available for all of these things. Some scholarships will be um, uh, perhaps cover the full cost of tuition. Other scholarships might be smaller. All of these scholarships can help make up um, the difference. And sometimes we see students um, getting, getting financial aid that is both need-based financial aid, but they might also qualify for a merit-based scholarship. So universities might combine the two together. But the key thing is finding out if universities offer this. So if you can't see on their website um, that they offer any financial aid to international students, um, you could write to them and check but we'd always recommend prioritizing the places that can actually meet um, your funding needs rather than applying to universities that don't have any money available and so this should really be part of your research process you don't want to leave this until after you get admitted um, because there's often not a lot you can do at that point but you want to be building it into your research um, and really thinking about it as you um, discover the different universities and have a look at their different um, websites. And then just to touch on sports scholarships, which are a form of merit-based scholarships. Sports scholarships are for uh, very talented athletes in a certain group of sports um, and universities will look to recruit athletes um, to, uh, to their university to play on their teams and the money will be linked to the student playing successfully on their team. Um, so we can talk a little bit more about um, sport, sports scholarships in the Q&A if anyone has questions um, about those and we are holding a webinar about sports scholarships separately as well. Okay, so and another, just one other form of funding is those external funding bodies. Like I said, most of those will tend to be fairly small amounts, perhaps $500, maybe $5,000. Um, but um, you know, and depending on whether you are a good fit for these um, for these scholarships, uh, for these scholarships or not. Um, but I do just want to draw your attention to uh, an example of a very big funding um, external funding body um, that has some very big um, scholarships available for British students. So um, an example of this would be the Moorhead Kane Foundation, which offers the Moorhead Kane Scholarship. Uh, the Moorhead Kane Scholarship is um, covers both tuition but also living costs um, for students from the UK um, to study at UNC Chapel Hill and um, that's in North Carolina it's a top state university um, and this scholarship not only covers the cost of uh, tuition and the cost of living but it also provides money and funds for um, the summer experiences um, and pre the degree as well, as well as this incredible network um, of Moorhead Kane scholarship holders. Um, so if you are interested in looking at scholarships, that's an example of one um, that is linked to a particular university but funded by a separate body, the Moorhead Kane Foundation. Um, so being aware of these kind of things and the kind of deadlines they might offer a separate um, application process alongside the application process to a US university. So you just want to be kind of aware of these and keeping on top of the deadlines as you're seeing them um, along the way. Um, you can also find on our website um, links out to all sorts of scholarship databases. So if you haven't um, explored those yet, um, please go and 
go and have a look um, and you can find links out to all sorts of different um, different things. So if money is um, part, um, part of your conversation about studying in the US, we just want to put out a couple of thoughts um, about uh, funding strategies. Um, so if funding is an issue for you in terms of making that US dream happen, um, you can think about um, the cost of living. Um, so just like studying in the middle of central London is more expensive than studying in, say, um, Lancaster, um, so too you'll find that studying in the middle of New York City is going to be a lot more expensive than perhaps studying um, in the suburbs of Chicago or in uh, somewhere in Texas. You'll find that those costs of living can be um, really dif different um, and it's worth thinking if you're um, thinking about um, studying in the US and money is an issue, um, do think about the impact of that that, that will have on, on your finances. Um, you can also look at the different costs of tuition. So there are some US universities that cost less than a UK university and some that cost an awful lot more. Um, so the case there is, is, is thinking about, um, are you looking at public universities which maybe have lower costs of tuition or private universities which tend to have higher costs but sometimes have more money available for the top performing students. It's worth thinking about these things as you're going. And then finally, just thinking about funding. Are you a competitive applicant at that university? Um, money tends to go to the students at the top of the pile. Um, so you're going to be wanting to think strategically about funding from the get go um, so that you can put the most strategic applications, to the best fit universities and therefore unlock that money. Um, and just make sure that you're asking yourself is, you know, if you're falling in love with the university, um, that's great, but just make sure that they have financial aid available scholarships um, or need based aid um, so that you can be sure that they can meet your need. Um, because time and time again here in the office, we see people who apply to a university and then suddenly realise that they can't afford to be able to, uh, to, to be able to take up their place. So knowing at the get go. From that research stage what what is this university's position do they have scholarships will i qualify for any of them um you know engage with the university and just be um really involved in that process um so to just touch um on other ways that you can think about funding so uh, in the us they have something called community colleges this is where you can go for two years to assert, to get your associate's degree um, and they tend to be very um, focused on teaching um, they tend to be an awful awful lot cheaper um, than a four-year university um, so you may find that you can do some significant cost savings there um, and then what they have is progression paths into four-year universities to, so that students can move having done their general study at a community college and then do their specialization at a four-year university just for two years so you can find if again funding is an, an issue you can start to have a look um, at uh, community colleges and perhaps explore this two plus two plus two model um, so for example Los Angeles Valley College um, is a community college in the LA area um, but they have some really great um, established links out to some top U US universities um, and students will use um, their two years at, at LAVC and then move on to um, a four-year university to to create their four-year degree um, so if there are any questions about community colleges please put them in the Q&A um, so just thinking about these other parts of um, uh, what does it look like to apply to a US university, you're going to find that the university application process is a little bit more intense than a UK university and slightly longer. Um, it is uh, a lot more, um, uh, there's just a lot, many more components and you're not doing it through one place necessarily. Um, so what are universities looking for? They're looking for top academics. So great grades in your GCSEs and your A-levels um, or your IB or your hires or whatever else you're taking. Um, they want to know that you're a good fit for that university. So if you want to study engineering, you want to be applying to universities with engineering. But you also want to demonstrate that you are the kind of student that they're looking for in terms of their student profile. Um, universities will also assess your extracurriculars. So these are things that you do outside of the classroom. Um, and universities will assess these as part of your application. 
So they want to understand who you are as a person. They want to understand you holistically. Um, so extracurriculars are a way for them to understand what you like to do with your free time. So um, that will be part of your application as well. And then they'll also want to understand your personal attributes. So these are things like your leadership, your character, your maturity, um, your life experiences so far. How do these add to um, being a member of their incoming class? Um, so these different components um, come through in the application process. You're going to fill out an application form, which has got standard biographical detail, um, but it'll also have a space for you to list your extracurriculars. You're going to um, add in some admissions exam scores, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, if you need those for the university that you're applying to. Um, your school will put together something called a transcript, um, which it, for our purposes here in the UK is essentially a listing of the grades, the subjects and grades that you got at your GCSEs and your A-levels um, or equivalent, um, or, or your predictions for your A-levels um, in there. Um, you'll write two to three essays, um, depending on the universities that you're applying to, um, and we'll talk a bit more about those in a second. Um, and then your school, your teachers will produce um, two to three recommendation letters that will be sent to the US University um, about you. And then you'll also submit an application fee per university that you're applying to. So this transcripts, um, as I mentioned, it's a listing of your academic qualifications um, and there is a whole template on our website. So if your teachers aren't sure what that needs to look like, you can just send them um, towards, towards that and they can download a, a template for them to fill out. Um, admissions tests are an area that we get a lot of questions about. So um, in the US, this uh, students um, may sit these admissions exams. It's a way for a university to assess candidates from different parts of the US and indeed the world. Um, so there are two main exams. Um, they are called the ACT and the SAT with reasoning. Um, these two exams, um, essentially, it's a little bit like Coke versus Pepsi. Um, in the end, they're essentially the same thing, but some people have a preference for one or the other. Um, the important thing to know is universities don't have a preference, they don't mind. Um, so our advice would always be, you can go onto Google, search ACT practice paper, search SAT practice paper, and you can download a full paper. Um, do that under timed conditions, um, and you'll see which one you do better on. Um, and then whichever one you do better on, that's the one you're going to study for. Um, these are um, exams that cover um, verbal, uh, your verbal skills and reasoning skills, your maths ability, your reading comprehension, things like that. Um, and they are multiple choice, um, quite different to any kind of exam that we sit here commonly in the UK. Um, so it's worth spending a bit of time getting prepared for them, um, whichever one you sit. Um, and you can uh, find that they they last for about four to five hours um, with a couple of breaks in built in um, but they are quite grueling exams to take so it's really worth um, uh, having a look at those and preparing for those um, you can find uh, lots of resources online there's free resources there's loads of websites you can pick up books from Amazon about how to study for these study guides um, or you can um, access uh, tutors who can teach you um, the different things here um, it's just being aware um, of where they where they sit. So sometimes we get asked, do you have to go to America to take these exams? They are both offered here in the UK um, about four or five times a year. Um, so they're set on certain days. So you'll go onto the SAT website or the ACT website, register for your place at your chosen test centre um, and pay your up. Uh, pay your, your fee to register, and then you'll go and sit the exam uh, at the same time as people around the world. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a different process. The thing I'd say is not all US universities um, require these exams, so double check carefully if you actually need to take them. Um, what you may find is that they help you qualify for scholarship money um, along the way. So um, do check if you need to take them um, and then you can also see on universities websites the kind of average school score for their incoming class. So you can kind of see how 
competitive you might be um, against other students. Um, and then just to note, there's something called the SAT subject tests. These are different to the SAT reasoning test. Um, subject tests are required by a small handful of universities. Um, and you can find out more on our website about subject tests. Most people won't need to take them, um, but some people will. And they are also sat here in the UK. Um, they are hour long exams around a particular subject, so around maths or around French, things like that. Okay, so um, testing tips, um, know what you're going into, um, spend some time having a looking online, take some practice tests um, before, before you go into a real test. Um, like I say, don't get hung up on whether it's the SAT or the ACT, pick whichever one you're doing strongest um, at and then um, uh, add that in, uh, practice for that exam um, and take it. You can take tests more than once, um, although it's expensive and stressful, um, uh, and the scores are valid for five years. So if you are in year 11 or earlier, you can also take them then. Um, be ready. Um, get there early, uh, make sure you've had some sleep the night before, um, and, and there are all sorts of um, websites and help books out there um, to help you get great scores on those exams. So just to talk a little bit about essays, again, it's this idea that US universities want to understand who you are, um, and most universities will ask you to submit an essay. Um, do not take your UCAS personal statement and copy and paste it into your US university application. Uh, US universities like to um, like students to write in quite a different way to how we write here. So you'll find these essays are incredibly personal to the student's perspective. What the university wants to understand is um, how, how, do, how does the student see the world? So it's not uncommon for a student to write um, something that is a very personal reflection. Um, for example, last year, one of my favorite essays that I read um, was about a student from Norfolk who worked at McDonald's. He had a part-time job at McDonald's. Um, and he told the story of one particular shift uh, at his part-time job, um, starting with him going in and putting on his uniform and the things that happened to him during that shift. And what you had a sense of was his perspective on the world, his viewpoint, um, uh, but it's a lot less academic perhaps than we're used to here in the UK. Um, so just, uh, you can normally find um, example essays. Uh, we've got some links on our website, but you can find all sorts of websites which have example essays, so you can kind of get a feel for what those might look like. Um, but just be aware that um, they are quite different to how we might write a personal statement here in the UK. And then the other thing that US universities will sometimes ask for is um, supplement essays. And these are, why do you want to come to this university? Um, so this is a really great way for you to demonstrate the, the research and your understanding of why you're a good fit for that university. Um, but again, it's a way for the university to understand more about who you are and what you're all about. Um, so just to give you an example of some of these supplement questions. Uh, so University of Chicago, one of the top um, research universities in the US, um, I think is ranked fourth or something at the moment. Um, so huge university and they're very well known for having very quirky questions. Um, so I will show you one of their supplements from a couple of years ago. Um, this was the entire question. Find X. That was, that was the entire supplement question. So apparently they had some students doing complicated mathematical formula, and then they had other students drawing treasure maps. Um, you really can have a little bit of fun and perhaps show a little bit of your perspective um, in life. Another question that they've, uh, they're have they well known for is what's so odd about uh, odd numbers? And um, this is another example of a, a question and again, um, showing perhaps way, how you think about the world and what you're interested in. Um, Dartmouth College up in New Hampshire, um, here's a question that they've used before. Um, so when you meet someone for the first time, what do you want them to know about you, but you generally don't tell them? Um, this is a much more personal question than perhaps, why do you want to study chemistry at Bristol, um, you're going to be um, encouraged to really think and reflect on who you are. So just being aware of all of these things um, as you're looking at your essays. 
Um, so those are some of the, the things that make up um, an application. I just want to touch um, on other opportunities to study in the US, um, and there are lots of opportunities. So if you've sat through this thinking, gosh, that's a lot of work, um, just be aware that there are some really great options. So um, if you're looking at also at UK universities, um, what you'll find is that lots of them opportun offer opportunities to go to the US. So for example, lots of UK universities will offer university exchanges. So this is where you'll maybe do a four year degree here in the UK, but you'll perhaps do the first two years at your UK university, then you'll go off to the US, spend a year on a US university campus before returning to finish out your degree here in the UK. Um, so that is an, a way of very cost effective way of getting to study in the US um, and something that lots of UK students look at. Um, you can also um, have a look at things like summer institutes. So lots of US universities offer summer programs. Um, Fulbright even offers a summer institute for undergraduate students studying at the UK university who want to go and study in the US. And this is our one is a particular one with the scholarship attached. Um, but do check those out. And then of course you can look at American studies programs here in the UK, which um, often are a lot more like a liberal arts style degree, so interdisciplinary, um, and often offer, offer an opportunity to go and study um, in the US as well. So just have a look at if you're interested in studying um, in the UK and the US, undergraduate level programs could be a really good fit for you. Um, you can also have a look for internships and uh, summer work, um, so things like Camp America remain hugely popular for UK students who want to experience the US. Um, UK uh, people are incredibly, uh, we, we're the biggest sender of camp counsellors to the US um, and so that can be a really great way to, to have that opportunity to explore the US, perhaps without having to apply for a full degree. Um, and then you can also have a look at postgraduate studies, so there is funding available for postdoctoral, uh, doctoral studies, PhD studies, but also master's programmes in the US too. Um, and so um, if you're interested in that, perhaps further down the line, um, that can be something you can explore. And of course, here at Fulbright, we um, offer a number of scholarships uh, for postgraduate students from the UK to go and study in the US. Um, so I just want to cover a couple of ways that we can help um, you find out more um, about studying in the US. Um, so first I just want to flag the Sutton Trust US program. So this um, is probably aimed at anyone who is in year 11 or earlier um, because we've closed the program now for year 12 students. But if you're in year 11 or earlier, um, uh, you can have a look at this program for next year. Um, so next November, uh, so this November, sorry, um, we will be opening up the program for applications again. It's for high achieving uh, year 12 students at state schools here in the UK who come from low income families. Um, and the program is free for students to attend and includes a trip to the US to explore US universities and then support through the application process. Um, so do check that out if you think that might be relevant to you. Um, you can also have a look on our website, so um, hopefully you register for this webinar on our website. But on our website we have a full guide to applying to the US, um, covering all the different things that we've talked about today um, and in a lot more detail. So please do have a look at that um, and uh, find out more about studying in the US. Um, I also just want to highlight USA College Day. This is um, our big flagship event. Um, we had uh, more than 160 universities come to, to visit us last year. They flew over just to meet British students. Um, it happens uh, in West London. Uh, entry is free um, and uh, it's a really great way to meet uh, admissions officers who will be making actual decisions and giving out actual money uh, to actual British students. So if you are interested, please put the dates in your diary. Um, registration for tickets for College Day will be on our website this August. Um, if you've got questions about studying in the US um, or you uh, want to build perhaps as something you specifically want to ask, we do take questions by phone or by email. Um, you can email us on advising at fulbright.org.uk uh, or use the form on our website um, and we'll endeavour to come back to you as quickly as possible and try and clarify anything or point you towards further resources to help. 
Um, we hold a number of events about staying in the US. So we hold events in person, but we also do events online. So please do have a look at those. We're going to talk about um, some more of these now. Um, so some of our upcoming online events, um, we have a webinar about finding financial aid where we'll go into a lot more detail about um, that financial aid process. That's on the 26th of February. We have a sports scholarship webinar. If you are a, an athlete, then that is one to check into on the 12th of March. Um, and this same seminar, Study in the US seminar, on the 19th of March, uh, and then a webinar about finding your best university fit. Um, so that's on the 4th of April. And then we'll also do uh, a webinar about student visas for anyone who has enrolled at a US university and is going through the visa process. So please do have a look at those. You can register for those from our website.